On the reverse of this card, draw or describe an artwork from today's visit that made an impression on you. This instruction is printed on the backs of blank postcards provided with pencils and a writing ledge at the tail end of our painting and sculpture installation. Completed postcards get dropped into ballot boxes. We put a selection of favorites on the wall as well as the museum's Facebook, street, um, Facebook page. So if success were defined by sheer participation, then we could call this a runaway hit. Um, truth is, not many people follow the instructions. <laughs> we're sometimes marveling at the profusion of strange stuff. The window into the minds of our visitors can be disturbing and, and illuminating at times. Uh, cats, the horses, unicorns, monsters, all manner of strange things. Um, things we can be pretty sure have nothing to do with what anyone saw at SFMOMA. Sorry, I can only draw a cat, one person writes. <laughs> Meanwhile, we see different people independently coming up with essentially the same drawing over and over again, day after day, when they can't possibly have seen each other's contributions. One of these uh, motifs, which I call love letters to Rothko, looks like this. A person or couple sits on a bench staring transfixed at this painting, number 14, my, Mark Rothko from 1960. And this is a drawing we see again and again. Whether people insert themselves into the image or not, uh, we can be sure that these are first-hand encounters, diaristic pictures. So with a stubby pencil and a piece of cardstock, they try as best they can to capture the aura of the painting or the tranquilizing spell that it casts. And we see lots of variations on this theme. So I think we're all familiar with this acronym. So this signifies a bewilderment. WTF is the young person's shorthand for wherefore art thou? <laughs> and, it, and it signifies a bewilderment with the ways of the world. Uh, many of these pictures we see of uh, alienation, people feeling out of place at the museum. And we see dozens of these, the I don't get it drawings, people rubbing their chins, scratching their heads with looks of helplessness or perplexity. Sometimes they're looking at an all black or all one color canvas. In the vernacular of cartooning, the monochrome painting gets to stand for all inscrutable avant-garde art. And the perplexed person, likely a self-portrait, represents all the people who have ever looked at art in puzzlement or frustration. We see hostility toward the monochrome painting, but it's important to remember that monochrome paintings are acts of provocation. The fact that after so much time, they have this undiminished, unsettling effect on people, testifies to their prescience and power. And meanwhile, there's a long-standing relationship between the avant-garde and cartooning. Newspaper cartoons emerged early in the, in the 20th century in the US and quickly became ubiquitous in every household. At the time, they were these elaborate, full-page Sunday spreads, and took, it took time to evolve into the formats that we're familiar with today. They undergo decades of simplification, a streamlining of their symbolic vocabulary. So a wider and wider range of human expression is, is captured with an increasing economy of line. The single panel gag cartoon, which is so familiar today, takes time to evolve. By the 40s or 50s, they reach maturity and they begin to look a lot like they do today. So anything that can be represented with a single line or gesture becomes the cartoonist's best friend. So modernism is full of easy targets for cartoon mockery. And what could be easier to lampoon than a white canvas? It seems one of Monochrome's chief functions in the world is to be mocked in cartoons. <laughs> Despite its hundred-year-old roots, the all-white painting still looks to many like a foreign invader, while its much, much younger cousin, the cartoon, feels right at home, ubiquitous, open, and accessible. Another prevalent motif, the I could draw that card. Again, the person <laughs> is looking at something emphatically simplistic, random squiggles, squares, more monochromes. Now saying I could draw that may be a remark of disdain, but it's also an affirmation of, of sort. 
a step on a path to artistic action. <laughs> and the visitor is not just idly saying, I could draw that, but they are actually picking up a pencil and drawing the thing that they are claiming they could draw. <laughs> in cartoon shorthand. But it's nearly impossible to distinguish sometimes the earnest from the ironic. I started out imagining two extreme ends of an emotional spectrum with the warm, fuzzy love letters to Rothko at one end and the cool disdain and alienation at the other. But isn't the very act of drawing, even, even if it's a picture of frustrated incomprehension, isn't that an engagement in a critical discourse with the museum? And isn't that critical discourse a holy grail of engagement that our museums are striving toward? In the end, we're left scratching our heads over the pictures our visitors leave behind, the same way they scratch their heads over the pictures we show to them. But there's beauty in the ra sheer range of expression, the passion and the disdain, the cats and the unicorns the whimsy alongside the dead serious. And all of this, just a few steps away from the austere, the priceless, the bafflingly opaque, the transcendently beautiful, and all that stuff that your kid could do. Thank you. <laughs>